Okay, so the next lecture, uh, before I get into chapter three, which is on uh, neuroweapons, I thought I would do a timeline of neuroweapons in a general overview, which will pretty much give you a very high level um, view of the rest of this work. Um, so basically, neuroweapons. Um, neuroweapons is a weapon that attacks one's mind. It not only attacks your individual mind, but it can also attack group minds, how people think in groups. And it can also even be used on a societal or, or even on a global scale. Uh, neuroweapons really began in uh, around 1919 is when like the, um, the earliest um, specifically related research that is related specifically to this topic uh, is put out. Uh, we need to understand a very significant event that happened in 1922 as far as this research goes. And this is a secret military uh, technological agreement between the German Reichswehr and the Soviet Union. This treaty of Soviet Soviet German cooperation uh, was put together, according to the research I've done, by uh, someone we already talked about in these lectures, uh, Kurt Jenke. Uh, Kurt Jenke is allegedly the main negotiator of this treaty. Um, what's Kurt Jenke? He, Kurt Jenke not only is involved with uh, <laughs> negotiating with the Soviets, he's also involved with negotiating with the Chinese. Uh, and this, his negotiations are all centered around one thing, to stop the encirclement of Germany by France, Britain, and Russia. So they're seeking ways to break out of the encirclement. And through this treaty, also remembering that they lost World War I, they are not allowed to maintain any kind of research legally in Germany related to developing weapons. So what they did is they went to the Soviet Union and offered them the for letting them develop weapons there with their cooperation. They would share the technology and they would also give them uh, their German German technology. Uh, this treaty lasted until 1932. Uh, the, at the conclusion of the treaty, basically most historians view the relationship between Germany and the Soviets on this end as the Germans gaining everything and the Soviets gaining hardly anything out of, out of, out of the deal. Um, what is significant, along with this Soviet-German cooperation, is the founding in Moscow and in Berlin of what's known as the Brain Institute. Now, the Brain Institute obviously studies brains, um, but some of the, this Brain Institute, especially the one in Moscow, uh, did some of the, the most uh, earliest research in the topics of um, neuroweapons, how they could be used. It, it was under the guise of, they would call it remote influencing. This involved the study of telepathy which actually begins all back here. Telepathy is what uh, neuroweapons are based on. Uh, you'll find uh, incredible amounts of disinformation and just all kinds of strange information that doesn't seem very scientifically plausible regarding telepathy. But if you have a secret weapons program that involves telepathy, you're definitely going to put out disinformation regarding telepathy. What you will find in these development with neuroweapons is just massive disinformation constantly uh, with what is really behind neuroweapons. 
The thing to remember about neuroweapons is every nation, every large nation, is, is actually developing these, and these are some of their most coveted and most covert and most secretive tools that they use in the great game. Now, telepathy, some of the earliest works in Russia on telepathy were by a person named Kaczynski, who we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about him later. He has some very interesting ideas. But this in, brain institute, the one in Berlin, The Brain Institute is always seen in Berlin by Oscar Boyd. Oscar Boyd is actually a, a socialist, but his funders throughout this entire research is by the Krupp family. The Krupps, K-R-U-P-P, -P, are armaments and defense industry uh, manufacturers. So they're interested in neuroweapons at a very early age, um, at a very early part in the uh, the development of the weapons uh, technology being developed, uh, you find like the people who are really investing in getting to know the brain are weapons uh, suppliers. Uh, in Oscar Boyd is in Berlin. He will be removed during the Nazi regime. When the Nazis come to power, he is removed. He goes off to another part of Germany, starts another brain institute, which again is funded by the Krupps. But after the, the Nazis come to power, the Berlin Brain Institute becomes uh, Nazified. The Moscow Brain Institute at this time, we're talking about back here, is led by a person named Bektorev. Bektorev does some of the uh, very early uh, Soviet research in remote influencing telepathy. One of his students who joins the uh, Brain Institute in Moscow, who becomes very, uh, a very important uh, developer of this technology, his name is L.L. Vesilov. And we'll, read, we'll, we'll talk about him some more later. The important thing about Vesilov is that he becomes like uh, after Bektorev dies, I think it was in 1927, Veselov becomes what, like the key researcher in this area in the Soviet Union. Um, in, 19, <coughs> in 1926, this is a very interesting story here. Um, a Russian science fiction writer, uh, I think his name is Belyev, uh, finds out about B.B. Kaczynski's research in telepathy uh, and remote communication, remote uh, influencing. Uh, he actually calls his communication biological radio instead of telepathy. Um, what happens in 1926, the this, this science fiction author Belia uh, writes this book which is syndicated in Russian uh, newspapers called The Ruler of the World which is based on Kaczynski's research. Now this uh, science fiction account of Kaczynski's research and other Soviet research up that time. So we have this, this uh, article being um, circulated in Russia in Russian about using re uh, remote influencing telepathy to rule the world. The story is about, ironically, the story is about a German banker who, who takes over his boss's bank using remote telepathy and remotely influences everybody around him to get that, hit them to do his bidding and he becomes the richest man in Germany and the ruler of the world by using this remote influencing technology. Um, it's an interesting um, 
dilemma that's going on here. In the Soviet Union, we know that the Soviet Union is a Leninist dictatorship. It's a totalitarian regime. Uh, it's based on scientific materialism. One of the hardest things for the researchers to do is to justify ideologically the research rather than the scientific results. Um, and up until in the early part, um, the Soviets were not like, they weren't really publicly, but like the Communist um, Party was not publicly supporting like this work, but this work was going on. And it was going on in a very covert manner. Uh, we'll read how one German researcher named Kernbach has written, you know, some of this Soviet research is still classified today from like the 1919s and 1920s. It is still some of the most secretive and most closely held cards that any uh, nation will have, especially with its intelligence and military um, operations. What is interesting next, I suppose, is that in, um, 1939, uh, a lot of the conspiracy theories about, say, uh, targeted individuals. So targeted individual is a person who is supposedly targeted by neural weapons. Uh, although it does not seem that it's always the government, it seems like most people who are targeted individuals may be targeted by private corporations, which is a state within a state nowadays in some respects. I'm not saying all corporations are bad. I mean, they, we have to look at the uh, all the different um, balances within each organization to figure out what is good and what is bad. Um, so 1939, according to these conspiracy theories, sorry, I'm getting a bit wavery, but uh, this conspiracy theory says that microwaves are responsible for uh, remote influencing what we call neural weapons today. Uh, that it's based in electromagnetic microwaves. And interestingly enough, the first studies on using microwaves to alter brain function and to alter your emotional state is carried out all the way back in 1939 by a Soviet researcher A Soviet researcher named Mikulevsky. And this is interesting because you can see that, you know, these there's no secrets in research. Intellectual property, whether it's in a business world or a military intelligence world, this intellectual property is like one of the most sought after uh, things in the great game of the intelligence world. I mean, they're always going to be trying to get more information about what your enemy is doing. So there's no doubt that the Nazis knew that electromagnetic microwaves were being used to alter um, people's emotions and their physiology all the way back in 1939. But um, one of the things that Kernbach mentions is that he, undoubted, he says undoubtedly the National Socialists were engaged in at least researching electromagnetic microwaves, if not using them. And we can, you know, there is no real um, socio-economic or socio-political explanation for the rise, the rapid rise of the Nazis and the way they were able to take over everything. You know, according to normative socio-economic analysis, you could not really explain this naturally. You could explain it if we could find actual evidence, and this is one of the hardest parts about the Nazis, because everything was burned down and they destroyed all their, their um, research as the various countries were invading Germany at the end of the war. However, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviets did receive some of this research from the Nazis from the paperwork that they had gathered up uh, after the war. Um, we definitely know that that research was taken to the Soviet Union. We, know, we definitely know that that uh, research was taken to the United States of America. This is according to uh, uh, a professor in East Carolina University who's written a book on neuroweapons. 
uh, his name is Krishnan, who says the United States also received this Nazi research. And what you will see What you will see is um, let's see where. <coughs> so the war what we'll see is like the war happens. Uh, we all know what happened during the war. Um, ostensibly, um, over six million people were killed in the Holocaust, uh, and never really fought back. It may, might also be for the same reason that they were using, uh, mind-altering waves, uh, based on electromagnetic waves to keep the prisoners docile and submissive. It's totally possible you can do that with this technology. Um, after the war, like I mentioned, the Nazis were not out of state power. They no longer have a state power, but we do know with the Fourth Reich plans that they were planning on building power through business, power through corporations. Um, one thing to note about the Soviet technology, which is also very interesting, uh, the Soviet development ceased to, they ceased all development uh, from 1937. In 1937, uh, there were the great Stalin, 1937-38, there were the great Stalin's purges, where the, uh, just before World War II, ironically, the Soviets purged their military of some of their best leaders, just before World, World War II, and they also shut down all neuroweapons-related research. This was under Stalin. Neuroweapons research did not begin in the Soviet Union again in in, uh, with vigor until the 1950s. And then when it did start off again, it really started up again with the full weight of the Soviet military's um, and the KGB's power behind it. Most of their research was done in the secretive world of the Soviet military and the KGB. Although there, there are a few public researchers who are outside of that world, the vast amount of the research is always being done in hidden military labs throughout the world. Um, but what does happen is we get this thing called Project Paperclip. Uh, project Paperclip is a project um, where the United States is going to recruit Nazi scientists working in various weapons industries, various weapons technologies from chemical, biological, to neurological weapons. And, and also this is how our space program took off too because we got Braun over under Project Paperclip to develop our rockets. Um, so with Project Paperclip, also neuroweapons developers are brought to the United States who are Nazis. Um, it's important to understand that this is also when the CIA is being created. This is when Nazi scientists are coming to America. And this is also when the forthright plans of the remnants of the Nazi movement are uh, rebuilding in Europe and getting ready to basically take over South America, which does happen. But in terms of uh, the development um, of this technology, it's really, the fundamentals are already figured out in the 1920s and 30s already. So there's no, it's really hard to tell when people really started using this technology to remotely influence other people, uh, especially for national defense purposes or for warfare. Um, an interesting thing that Kaczynski came up with in 1952. Uh, in 1952, he came up with the concept of that the eyes uh, not only take in electromagnetic radiation, but can also transmit electromagnetic radiation. 
Um, in the, this is also around the time that we'll get into uh, MK Ultra in the United States. And we'll go over this history in the next lecture. M uh, not the next one, but eventually in one of these lectures, we'll get to MK Ultra. MK Ultra um, was a secret CIA program based on Nazi German interrogation techniques where they um, were studying how the Nazis would use um, mind altering drugs. Uh, for instance, back in the 30s, uh, this person named Hans Bender, who will hear about much later in, in, this, uh, in these lectures. Hans Bender was an SS scientist uh, who investigated telepathy and after the war he continued his investigations and at some point was also a paid uh, contractor for the NSA working in Germany, uh, consulting with them on certain uh, of these neuro weapons issues that had come up. But MK Ultra mind, some say it's mind control with an ultra, ultra means top secret. It used to, ultra was the old designation for top secret. Uh, MK is actually a funding, a funding uh, letters used within the CIA bureaucracy to keep track of things. But um, it is eventually shut down in the 1970s uh, through a special investigation that is conducted by the Congress called the Church Committee. Um, but it never really shuts down. They just changed the funding name. So when they go to the, when they put it in the black budget for the next year's budget, it's not called MK Ultra. It's called something else. So they never really shut down these programs. There's really, um, everything becomes really, um, I don't know, almost static in terms of developing the technology for, for a long time. Um, when the Soviets pick up again, they really, um, they take it to like um, a higher a higher level because at this point we're also getting um, the convergence between computer technology and biological uh, investigations is starting to um, converge. And this happens in the Soviet Union uh, sooner than other places. The Soviets, uh, what they start to do with with their military investigations into neuro, neuro weapons is actually start to uh, use computers to run the programs. Um, there is this one thing that was captured in the 1970s in Vietnam where the Soviets were the allies of the Vietnamese against the United States. There is a um, device there that they were using against um, captured Americans called the LIDA device, and this is uh, basically a form of corrective behavior. Um, it shoots out lights and messages subliminally to you, and it rewires um, the captive persons or prisoners' thinking and bends them to how they want people to think. It's a form of brainwashing, but using technology to brainwash people rather than physical violence or torture, or physical torture. Uh, but they cap the United States captured this, and they started studying this, and they saw how it was being used to correct people's behavior. And we know that this is also back when COINTELPRO is starting because of the MTV protests. But COINTELPRO, you could really say, it goes back to um, a common idea with it, which really goes back to British and uh, Nazi German intelligence uh, techniques. Uh, in East Germany, we have this thing called Zurzetzung. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't spell it properly, but I don't. <laughs> but anyway, Zurzetzung is uh, basically taking people who are against communism and rewiring their brain through various means, including stalking and harassment and targeting and imprisonment to take people who are against the system to turn them into people that are for the system. Um,
the 60s and the 70s, um, and to a large extent in the West in the 80s is really just fine tuning the technology. Um, it really, <clears throat> uh, it really hits into the uh, 1980s. Soviet computer tech. This is when they start using computers on an even more massive scale. Like the LIDAR, the LIDAR machine is just one machine and it's just sitting there. This is when they start to do it on a more mass scale. They start creating algorithms They start creating uh, computerized algorithms to um, to create programs to to do this corrective behavior or remote influencing on like foreign powers or whoever you're up against. The 1990s is when it really starts to get interesting. This is when 